once the technology has become more invasive and it's no longer an external, as McLuhan would say, I suppose, an extension to man, once it's internal, there's very little that you can do about it because you're signed up to some terms and conditions then, which is literally become an internal operating system to you and your identity. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Pardon, and you are listening to the Feedback Loop on Singularity Radio, where we keep you up to date on the latest technological trends and how they're impacting the transformation of consciousness and culture. This week, my guest is futurist Tracy Follows, who recently released her book, The Future of You, Can Your Identity Survive 21st Century Technology? In this episode, we explore many different aspects of identity and privacy, including narcissism, how our identities are being flattened into carbon copies of one another, anonymity, how our digital identities are influencing the way we live our lives, and so much more. So without further ado, let's just go ahead and jump into it. Everyone, please welcome to the feedback loop, Tracy Follows. What I've found lately interviewing authors is that the subtitles of their books often are very telling. And with your new book, The Future of You, you asked the question, can your identity survive 21st century technology? What are the threats that you see to our identity that uh, technology poses? Oh, gosh. You know, I thought there were quite a few when I started, but as I went on this journey, (laughs) now I just see them everywhere, Um, almost as if everything's a threat to our identity. But I think that's because I'm probably seeing all of this through the lens of, I guess, suppose my belief that um, identity is the fundamental issue of our generation. Um, I think everywhere you look, whether it's the sort of globalist versus nationalist um, versus localist um, political um, narratives or tension, whether it's looking at what's happening with you know, racial politics or, you know, transgenderism, group identity, some call it identity politics. I think whether you would look at vaccine passports um, and credentials um, for immunization, everything that's happening around us at the moment, to me, um, seems like, you know, on the one hand could be an opportunity, but also could equally, as things always are, (laughs) could also be a threat. Um, But I think when I started on this on this journey, which was probably like 2016, um, which feels such a long time ago now. Um, It was really um, something that happened to me um, when I was on Facebook. Um, And you'll know if you read the book, but um, you'll know that I was kind of locked out of my Facebook account and couldn't get back in. And when I did try to get back in, Facebook told me that I wasn't me. You know, fair enough. Um, I think that was the realization actually that some of the things I've been thinking about kind of comes around to the nub of the issue, which is we have an outer technology, a machine reading our identity and potentially authenticating or verifying us and who we are. And in a world in which we don't really have a, uh, a singular theory of identity, of course, and you might argue, why would we? We now seem to have this singular theory emerging that you know you are who the machine, the external AI or the technology says you are. And I suppose that's what I think is the is the major threat. Yeah, you described, I think at one point that you said a, a big part of your motivation for writing the book was that you no longer felt in control of your identity. Was that uh, an accurate description of kind of one of the motivators, I guess? Yes, I think so. Um, It's interesting you say that because as I was writing it, um, and even when um, I was discussing with editors and and other people, I was tended to keep going off track as I felt into the area of privacy. I was like, I'm not really as interested in privacy. What I'm really interested in is autonomy. How do we have autonomy over our own identity? It's such a difficult thing to research and talk about really because it's one of those really quite intangible things but when something happens then you kind of pinpoint and go that's it 
<laughs> that's what I mean. Um, and so it's almost like the negative of it. It was you one goes around one's life and daily rituals and not thinking about it too much, then something happens and draws your attention to the fact that, oh yes, actually, I'm not as in control of my identity as perhaps I thought. Um, yeah, and, and so it really is, and to go to your original point about the subtitle, it really is that idea about, am I losing control of my identity? Are all of us losing control of our own identity? And perhaps in some ways, we're happy with that because we seem to have outsourced everything else uh, to machines. So maybe it will be more convenient. But I just think we ought to have at least a debate um, and a discussion about that before it happens. And um, and then, as I did in my particular case, all of us generally go, oh, hang on, we've lost we've lost control of our identities. You mentioned before, uh, which I think is a really interesting point, the fact that identity politics right now seems to be I would say on the rise, there's an argument that we've always had identity politics, especially given, you know, the history of wars and all the different things that were very much based on nation or race or whatnot. But it seems that we are in a particular uh, fever pitch about it right now. And do you think that it has to do a lot with the kind of way digital technology is uh, kind of molding our behavior online? Is it things like blurring national boundaries where our cultures are now having to be forced into clashing and we have to reconcile, you know, being exposed to these other cultures. Do you think this digital frontier is what's really driving this or are we just seeing it more now because we have the digital technology to see it? Mm, it's such a good question. Um, and maybe as with most things, it's a bit of both. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's not one or the other. Um, and um, I mean, we do like to polarize things these days, but let's, <laughs> I'll try not to, because I think it is quite nuanced. I mean, obviously it's the whole Goffman thing about our identities being performative. You know, we, we play them out in these theatrical ways in social media. And of course that isn't just um, one way traffic. We are very aware of the reactions of our performance. And of course that sometimes encourages us to explore and be a bit more extreme, but perhaps it's just a case of us liking a bit more what we see coming back to us through the mirror of, of that, that black mirror, if you like, of, of, the, of the smartphone. I think it's a bit of that. Um, but I think one of the other things that is a big technological change, of course, is this idea of us being able to um, leave the sort of physical body, the substrate that we may have been born in and the whole notion of morphological freedom. Um, and that has a kind of um, religiosity about it. I think it always has, we've always wanted in terms of you know, religion or spirituality to leave the physical behind because there is some higher, more transcendental spiritual state. Um, and in a funny sort of way, I think as a technology potentially, some technologies anyway, make that more possible, in the foreseeable future, I mean, not maybe the next five years, but maybe the next 20 or 40 years, or you'll tell me like maybe 2049, um, you know, as that becomes more possible, um, I think it is on our radar now, it's in our, our vision that that is a, a real possibility. And we sort of, in a way, playing that out through virtual reality, you know, we are leaving our physical body behind and we are exploring these other worlds sometimes the real world, well, it's all the real world now, isn't it? These, these, these numerous worlds, and we're able to explore our, our own identities in, in that way. I think when, when I've done research and when I've talked to people who, much more than me, because I'm not really a gamer, um, who are involved in virtual reality worlds and gaming, they always tend to use the same sort of language, which is, you know, um, well, there aren't any rules, or you can be who you want to be, or, it is definitely in that sense of escapism. And so we're, we're playing out a sense of escapism from what physically might restrain us mm -hmm. in all sorts of ways, whether that be in the virtual world or the real world. And I think those two are, are sort of chivying each other on and it's becoming more and more of a possibility. Yeah, when you mentioned morphological freedom there, <clears throat> it makes me think that ironically, though, we seem to be more focused on picking one identity and running with that and, and fixing our identity uh, and curating our identity, especially in the digital world and social media, 
rather than having something that's more nebulous, more flexible. Like we seem to be kind of betraying the very uh, beauty of identity that technology offers. Do you think we do? Like maybe we do in the present, but I wonder if we if we think about somebody, yeah, we're not the same people that we were sort of five, 10, 20 years ago, obviously, <laughs> thank goodness. Um, we're not, and I, I just, I just wonder if we, because we are stuck in this sort of digital formatted media, we do tr tend to have that presenteeism. But I imagine lots of people who are exploring their identities in one way today will be exploring them in very different ways in five years or 10 years, because to your point, you know, technology comes around and it makes new things possible. Um, I, I, I don't know, I was listening to, um, I think I mentioned to you before, I was listening to this Eric, Eric Schmidt interview and he was talking about, it's something I talk about in the book, but he was talking about AI digital assistants. And he was going much further than perhaps I was going when I was talking about the need, potentially the need to have them, but how that having them around us is going to influence us and our own identity. Obviously it kind of impacts us. We, again, it's another reflection of us through our profiling and everything. But he was talking about how potentially an AI that's making decisions for you um, that's seeing things that you haven't seen yet because it's analyzing the data, has the potential to access a new world, a new dimension, if you like, that isn't really perceptible to us through our own senses. And I actually thought that was really fascinating. So you can imagine it's a bit like us thinking we're very enlightened today, but actually we're still in Plato's cave. You know, there is a, a sense that the technology that the AI is going to push past some of these frontiers, access other dimensions to the world, which we just couldn't possibly with our own senses. And I wonder if that again is going to be another step on for our identity. So maybe at the moment we think we've got these fantastic, fluid, you know, flexible, enriched identities that could go pretty much any, any way. And the danger of that, of course, is that they're too fragmented and, and can't be managed and are disintegrated. But maybe we this is only the, the tip of the iceberg. Maybe there's a whole new set of dimensions that we that we, we really don't even have any sense of at the moment. Yeah, and I wonder how overwhelming that is or if we have a, a natural fear of that because I, I believe you mentioned at one point that you're concerned with the idea of safetyism and the fact that uh, maybe to a certain extent we want technology um, or governments or society to tell us what our identity is and to kind of give us a very easy script to follow. And that in fact, figuring out our identity for ourselves is very overwhelming and full mm. of uncertainty and anxiety. It's funny, isn't it? Because it tends to, it goes back to that collective identity. We think we create and set our own identity, but we don't really, it's so dependent upon our social identity. I guess we've got our own inner self of identity and our social identity. And we're kind of always toggling between the two, trying to work that out. I do feel like suddenly, particularly since the pandemic, we've got a kind of state coming along and suddenly sort of moving in between that relationship and sort of dictating a little bit more than we would have been used to what our identity should be. And that is mainly because we've been so socially atomized during the pandemic. And so we've, we've only really been able, to, um, been able to sense some of the messages and some of our community through media and being given these messages, which one may or may not think are propagandized, but they tend to all follow a similar, uh, a, a similar narrative, should we say. And I wonder if that is really having quite a big effect on our own identity and sense of identity crisis. Because when we are allowed to explore our identity, when we are in our social groups that constantly affirm our identities and make us feel more comfortable in some of these groups, whatever those groups are we've chosen and however wide ranging they may or may not be. At the moment, we are kind of, or we have been stuck at home, struggling with identity because we're being forced to you know, step into this pattern or this programming. I wonder if it's more of a programming, it's like a social programming. Um, and that, that can be quite uncomfortable if you feel that's not really the direction <laughs> you, you want to take. Um, and I, and I, do, I do think you know, your original question about threats, 
you're right, this becomes more and more overwhelming, the more and more mediated our society and our experiences are, the more difficult it's going to be uh, to stay sane and have a, a sense of an integrated identity. So no doubt there will be people who think that AI and more technology is the solution to that. But um, yes, I wonder. Yeah. Do you think that it's potentially making us more xenophobic in that way? Like where we're getting into these echo chambers in these groups and we get so used to people agreeing with us that we lose our capacity for dealing with confrontation or conflict or difference. Cause it seems like there is a lot of um, behavior right now, you know, Brexit and a lot of other things where it's like, we're pulling away. We're trying to limit our identity. We're trying to make everything more. Yeah. I want you to be vegan and not vegetarian. I want you to be, you know, this specific form of uh, identity politics and not this form. And it feels like we're trying to continually otherize people by limiting who we count as us. That's right, it's, uh, it's exactly the word I was going to use, othering. Um, and that's, I think, um, that is definitely a result of feeling less comfortable and less tolerant. Um, we used to be, I think, you may disagree, um, I used to think we were much more tolerant of differences in general in society. And now that we're not so tolerant and there tends to be this suggestion that whoever is the other in your experience or your worldview um, cannot be trusted. They can't be trusted to cohere around the set of beliefs that you yourself and your group have adopted. And therefore, if they can't be trusted, they need to be controlled. And so there is this overwhelming need to control whether that's with technology or whether it's with policies or whether it's with you know behavioral economics or as we call it here in the UK, nudge theory, which I'm, I'm sure you're well versed in. Um, there's a bit of a backlash against nudge here. Um, whether it's that, there's definitely a sense that actually we have moved into some sort of new mode, which isn't so much to do with the importance and the prioritization of tolerance of many, many different views. Uh, social cohesion seems to be much more um, important now. And that actually people on the periphery who kind of aren't gonna go along with whatever is being socially programmed, kind of need to be left behind um, because we're all, we've been harmonized, if you like. But of course, you know, the harmonization of a group of people who necess don't necessarily want to be harmonized is, is quite a dangerous place to be. It's, it's such an interesting topic because there's, there's aspects of this that are, seem very restricted to the digital space, but they transcend the digital space so much and become part of the real world. Right. And I'm thinking about how hashtag movements become real life protests and things like that. And I'm wondering, I guess, what are your thoughts about how the digital space is kind of stepping into the real world and impacting our behavior? And, and like you said, it's a tough thing because the digital space is very much the real world now. You know, if we perceive it, if we react to it, if we feel from it, it is real. But there is still an element of it, I think, that has to be somewhat considered as separate or maybe not as tangible. Yes, that's right. I think um, the the less tangible, the more invisible these spaces that we occupy become, the more we want to assert our own identity in some way. And then we end up overcompensating for that because it's too assertive. And then that tips over into aggression, which begets more aggression. And then you're into just a very, um, just very tense, very uh, poor quality, should we say, um, discussion and, uh, and dialogue communication, even if you get people talking at cross purposes all the time. Um, and it was one of the things that Marshall McLuhan talked about. I've just been researching a lot, actually, about what he was talking about with identity. Obviously, I'm a bit of a fan, um, but I was digging into this a bit deeper. And actually, Andrew McLuhan, because I do his classes, actually, he, he was helping me with this because one of the things I was wondering was what's going to happen with the, I am going to say this word, metaverse. Sorry, apologies, everyone. Um, what is going to happen with the metaverse? Because one could think that we're going, it's going to get more and more difficult because McLuhan was sort of saying that 
you know, once you're on the new frontiers, or you're on the frontiers of new media, this is where your identity is less well developed, you overcompensate, and actually it can, I mean, of course, he was talking about extremists, um, he was talking about it ending in violence. Um, if you go into the virtual reality world, will this just escalate and become even more of a symptom? Whereas I was wondering if actually will we address some of the problems that we're facing in social media because we will have more ability to characterize ourselves in virtual reality, we'll have haptics, we'll have more senses. Maybe we will even get this feed from AI, you know, to give us these new detections of different dimensions to reality. Maybe we'll much more flesh out our character, our personality, our profile, our, our identity. And therefore we won't feel so threatened. And I, I just, I wonder which way it's going to go. Um, but obviously you'd hope it would be the latter. Yeah. Do you think that that is an optimistic journey for us to take? <laughs> like, is it is it possible that we'll uh, become the versions of ourselves that we haven't been able to become in, in the real world? Or is it possible that we'll create a kind of... Um, <clears throat> like multiple personality disorder where we'll have a, a cognitive dissonance or a schism of, or, or even a lack of appreciation for who we are. You know, there, there could be a, a sense of um, danger, I guess, to constantly ripping somebody away from the version of themselves that they wish they were, and then making them retreat back to themselves and being like, Oh, I hate this version of me, but this is what I was born as. I wish I could always be that other person. So there's a there's a beauty to that, right? To that flexibility and that self-actualization. But then if you have to come back into the real world and you have to reconcile who you actually are, there's a dark side to that too. Yes, exactly. So the integration of ourselves between those two sort of physical selves and digital selves, or that be the same person potentially, is going to be dependent upon how integrated these new virtual worlds and the physical world as we know it, and potentially another world, who knows, how, how integrated those are going to be, or, or the kind of access that people will have to those, because, you know, it's probably going to be the case that not everybody has the same amount of access and the same sort of augmented types of experiences, um, especially if it comes down to sort of monetary uh, wealth and access based on, I don't know, tokenization or, um, you know, if you're going to um, do certain um, tasks, um, if you're going to earn tokens, if you, I don't know what the access points will be. I don't know the currency of the uh, that will be required for access, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, but it will be dependent on something that is scarce, otherwise it won't be any, of any value. And therefore, because it's scarce, not everybody's going to have the access, are they? So maybe we will find that we are literally creating these different strata of society or different strata of, of individuals, some with much more integrated identities than others. But one of the things that is going to be quite interesting is whether we can kind of meet ourselves in other in other versions of identities in the same space, whether one can really go back, almost go back in time and meet up with one's younger self or older self or other self somewhere. Because I do think that is going to be really interesting in terms of sort of mental health um, and, um, yeah, I just, I just, I wonder... I mean, there is that app called Freud Me. Well, I think it's called something else now. They renamed it. But that that sense that you can have like a <laughs> um, psychiatric session with yourself mm. where you are at one, one hand, you are the patient explaining what may be your ailments. And on the other hand, you take the, the position and the role of the psychiatrist and you try and work out your own problems. I sort of wonder if, you know, when we meet up with our other selves, whether we'll be able to have these conversations and <laughs> maybe we'll go spiral into even worse identity crisis, <laughs> or maybe actually it will be some sort of therapeutic integration of our identity. It sounds a bit um, mad now, but I think it's totally realistic. Yeah, that they say uh, talking to yourself is a sign of madness, though, right? Isn't that a, a yes. dangerous road? Uh, do you, what do you think it's doing to us in terms of maybe our personality? Because one of the things that I am most deeply concerned about um, is honestly narcissism uh, and the dangers of just uh, self-absorption. You know, a lot of people would argue, <clears throat> like Edward Bernays, speaking of Freud, uh, Freud's nephew Edward Bernays is known as you know the father of public relations. And what he's kind of known for in a lot of circles is 
basically exploiting people's ideas or desire to be individuals so that they'll be good consumers. And, and in fact, a lot of his legacy could be viewed as, you know, uh, tuning up narcissism for the sake of greed. And it feels like that's a place we might actually be right now. And technology is exacerbating that rather than helping it. Um, so you're talking to somebody who worked in advertising for 20 years. So, <laughs> Whoops, no. <laughs> I've, exactly. I've, I've sold narcissism and been, been amongst it. Um, I de yes, I, definitely that is a, is a huge threat. I don't know what the answer to that is other than maybe the Overton window for narcissism has shifted and is shifting. And I just, I mean, I think it is. Um, and I, I don't know whether some of that narcissism is all, always about individualism. I think sometimes it, it very much is, you know, the, um, the fueling of the collective is definitely about wanting to belong and saying the things that one needs to say to feel and be seen as if one belongs. I mean, whether that's narcissism or not, I, I don't know. Mm. Um, but there's, it's what is very true is that it's becoming more and more difficult to work out what is fiction and what is reality and even what is fiction and what is reality about oneself as we move into these worlds and as we're in much more mediated worlds definitely the reality to some extent is becoming decoupled from the narrative now that might be a fairly narcissistic narrative one who's constructed for oneself or it might just be a world narrative but this is what I think is quite interesting about what Facebook did with Meta, <laughs> um, certainly the way that they presented it. And I think somebody, I don't know whether it was Vice magazine wrote it up like this. It was literally almost like, OK, well, you're going to leave your real world problems behind as if they don't exist and construct a, a, a new reality in which <laughs> the world is very different. And you can and, and none of those problems um, are actually present. But this is exactly what the otaku do in in Japan, when they're thinking about and obsessed with anime and manga and all these characters, they it's not a naivety um, that they are more interested in these fictional characters and fictional worlds. It's because they prefer them to the real, let's say, call it real world, the physical world. And actually, they feel like they can construct new standards, new values um, in these new worlds that they feel they have more belonging in. And I just wonder whether that's where we're sort of going. Um, now, one could see that as very narcissistic. One's creating a character for oneself, um, maybe in an obsessive way, uh, maybe even creating a new world for oneself, but it potentially is because it's easier to do that and it's more comfortable to do that than try and struggle with the messy, complicated human um, world in in reality again i don't know what that is going to do to our minds what that's going to do to our social relationships although in terms of relationships they're not what they used to be either because they're i heard a great quote the other day um you can't really say the relationship ended because it never really started that's what these relationships are like in these in these more invisible intangible ethereal worlds um, and so they're sort of forever ongoing but not that deep with not that much substance. Um, and it does seem like we are heading in that direction, definitely. Yeah. For me, I guess I wonder because I've studied some psychology and one of the things mm -hmm. I tend to find in a lot of the studies, a lot of the literature is that, you know, basing your um, sense of worth from the attention you receive from others is typically one of the worst predictors of, of life satisfaction and mental health, right? A lot of what we seek is the self-actualization or comfort or love of self. And I guess, I don't, I guess I don't even know if narcissism was the right word, but I guess it's more just like attention seeking or like deriving one's value based on the perceptions of strangers. You know, we used to, we used to exist as tribes of 150 people where I directly knew what every single person I would meet in my entire life knew about me. And now I'm getting hearts from thousands of people who know nothing about me or making comments about me. And we're because that's now tied to capitalism and survival in a lot of ways. If you're an influencer or a marketer or anything, um, we've kind of made that the ultimate currency uh, for our value to, to humanity and 
all the studies show that that's not a good thing. I think it's even potentially worse than that because those those likes might just be coming from machines. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. that, that audience, as you know, that audience isn't even necessarily a human audience or a bunch of strangers. It's literally just strings of code. And one wonders then, um, who is talking to who? And if I have my digital assistant and you have your digital assistant and they really are that sort of integrated and with each of us and, and know each other. So maybe they just have the conversation between themselves and we're, and we're left out of it. I mean, one could argue that that is incredibly narcissistic or one could argue that actually it's not narcissistic at all because we are sharing all of ourself with our bot or our digital assistant and we're outsourcing it because they're going to have a better conversation than we are or they're going to make a better decision than we are. I think these are some of the decisions uh, and discussions we've got to start having about where are these boundaries. Um, we have these fragmented selves now distributed across the internet. It very much feels like, to go to, back to the original point, that we're not in control of the integration of our own identity ourselves. Do we embrace that? I mean, do we worry about it and try and sort of put it all back together? Or do we embrace that and go, it's fluid and it's distributed. And all I really need to do is have a, have a framework and have some tools for understanding and managing that. Um, I don't know the answer to that. And I, I should say, <laughs> obviously, um, but I have lots of questions, but it's, I've actually found, I don't know what you think about this. I found quite a difficult, um, area to broach with people and for me it's it's so important identity because unless you have your identity it's very difficult for you to accept responsibility or be given a duty or even to sort of assign emotions to oneself versus somebody else that's next to you or a group emotion if you like and I think this is really fundamental and elemental um, and yet I hear a lot these days about, oh, identity is just an illusion and it doesn't really matter. And why worry about it anyway? And anyway, your identity will just be your, I don't know, your, your Bitcoin hash and your private key or whatever. Maybe it will be in the end. But to your point, that's a rather transactional way of thinking about one's identity. Um, but it's quite hard to engage with, with people on it because there are so many other big issues. And it's almost like it's so close to home that people are looking beyond it. Yeah, well, it's kind of like the existential foundation upon which everything else sits, right? So if you pull that rug out from under us, in rushes the chaos. I mean, that does seem like a big part of this, right, is there, there's a socioeconomic aspect to this that I think is underlying a lot of what we're talking about, which is that desire for escapism might be the fact that a lot of people don't feel well served by the world as it is you know if you're if you hate your job if you have a shitty commute if you don't like your apartment if your roommates are loud you're gonna put on noise canceling headphones and go into the matrix and unplug and run your guild in the video games or be the king of the server and discord or whatever and feel great about yourself and then you have to go back into the other world but I know, I, I guess I wonder, would we be so eager to migrate into the digital sphere if things were better organized on a societal level in this sphere? Mm. I, who knows? Yeah. I, I don't know. Some days I think it could be a lot worse and some days I think it could be a lot better. Um, but I do feel like now we are so overwhelmed with media, so overwhelmed with propaganda and information, particularly in the last sort of two years, that it is a distraction from some much, much bigger questions that either intentionally or accidentally, people don't want us to delve into too much um, because who, who wants to start unraveling that, you know? Yeah, you mentioned there at one point, it got me thinking um, about the way the bots are potentially doing the likes and whatnot. Do you feel like we're potentially getting trapped in these identities? Because uh, I have a lot of concerns. I've thought a lot about this issue. I think it's very fascinating. Um, but I worry that because algorithms are modeling us to figure out what to advertise to us and whatnot, 
that we're actually being forced into these kind of very static identities that are very underwhelming because I think a lot of uh, the joy in life comes from growth and being growth oriented. And if you're constantly being shown things you've already shown that you like, you're never being shown new opportunities or newness or novelty or things that might spark curiosity. So do you think that maybe we're getting kind of trapped in our identities because of the way these algorithms are re self-reinforcing rather than exploratory? Yes, definitely. Because um, um, I've had this discussion with a few people that what happens is we get flattened out. Um, as my friend Bronwyn would say, we're flat, our identities are flattened. And I always use the example of, um, you know, all the very characterful, beautiful, individual luxury brand logos like Balmain and Chanel and all of those and you look at all of those and they're for the most part signatures or they certainly were Yves Saint Laurent started out like that you look at where they are now in the digital environment and every single one is a bold condensed <laughs> typeface which all look the same and I think it's a really good analogy for what's happened to us us with our individual characteristics and persona and our frailties and foibles and um imperfections and now suddenly in the digital world a platform or an algorithm or machine learning has to, in order to push us through as training data has modified us to our most simplest expression and our most simplest expression is fairly si similar to the person next to us sort of thing and I, I definitely think that's happening a few years ago when I was doing a, a project for um, Sky actually on the future of media I was talking to what were then, you know, fairly young but innovative people in media and Spotify was quite a new thing at the time. And they were talking about how, you know, Spotify, not to pick on Spotify, but as, but, but this was the, the specific example they used, how Spotify can't keep up with their interests. So, you know, it, it's exactly as you just said. Um, it's responding to what you liked last or what your friends liked or a playlist you listened to or whatever. And so it keeps serving you up the same stuff. Um, but it doesn't take account for the fact that you might meet someone new who takes you to, I don't know, a jazz club and suddenly then you're into jazz. And then um, Spotify doesn't really know this and it can't like serve you any of that kind of content. And the person who was describing this to me said, I was so fed up that I ended up creating a new identity to dig myself out of the algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> so yes it's flattening out our identities but maybe in a funny sort of counterintuitive way it's encouraging us to create new faux identities just so we can you know experience new and innovative and <laughs> new new sensations that the algorithm isn't aware of or can't keep up with i like that idea but i'm already struggling keeping track of the few identities that i have i don't know if i could manage more accounts <clears throat> do you have a pseudonymous identity no because hmm. that's one of the interesting areas isn't it yeah well i was going to ask what do you think about um anonymity you know being anonymous in the world like what role do you think that plays right now in the digital space <clears throat> i think it's very important that we don't kind of go into this sort of legal um version in a virtual worlds of a reality where anonymity isn't possible and i think that because especially, you know, increasingly, I'm starting to think, you know, whistleblowers are very important. People need to be able to speak out and um, say what they really feel or think or have experienced. And I think that's very, very important. On the other hand, of course, one will always hear the argument about all of the abuses that happen, you know, th th um, through the channel of someone's anonymous accounts. And yes, I mean, absolutely, that's, and those abuses can be incredibly serious and those are there. But I don't think, we need to find another way of solving it because I don't think the way to solve it is just go, well, you, you just can't have anonymity. It's just too important. And that's a liberal democracy. It's a fundamental, it's, it's connected to free speech. And um, I don't think it will be doing us any favors if we, if we go down that, uh, that route. And when we start to think about, you know, authentication and verification of identities and, and think about anonymity and pseudonymi pseudonymity <laughs> um, there, just because I mean, you can have pseudonymous um, identities which aren't fully 
anonymous, of course, because not everybody knows who you are, but somebody might know who you are. And that might be the bank or that might be whoever it is who is at the, the, the root of that authentication or verification. And I think, you know, I think that's a more interesting, and more practical solution. Um, yeah. I don't want to see, see uh, any of our rights stripped away under the under the, under more safetyism again, you know. Yeah. Do you think it would be good or bad than if we had something like a social security number that was hidden from the public and allowed us to create anonymous accounts, but was required as like a hash or some kind of cryptographic thing to yeah. sign up to sites so that we do get rid of maybe the bots who are liking people and creating false identities or the maybe the Russian hackers or the, you know, the, the stuff that really is just, taxes, right? Yeah. right. But it's just a lot. There's a lot of noise that stokes group think and kind of um, cult like behavior that yeah. might fall away if the people who were all engaged actually were real humans. Um, but then again, like you said, we, we run the risk of someone tracing back that identity to that digital ID and saying, Oh, that's X, let's silence X because we know that that's that person. Exactly. And what, and, and some people will support that because they want X to be silenced. But at some point, it won't just be X, it will be Y. And, and that will be, they won't be so keen on that. And so we have to always keep that in mind, I think. Yeah, I mean, the whole, it's very hard to keep up with what's going on in, in, in decentralization land. Um, I mean, it's moving so, so fast. Um, but I think, you know, whether it's a private key that matches a public key or digital identifiers or whatever it is, I really would prefer to see a solution. And none of these are panaceas, of course, I would prefer to see a solution which is based on a decentralized system, um, a trustless system, whatever, however you want to, to think about it. It doesn't have to be blockchain based, of course, it, it doesn't have to, um, but I really don't want to see anything centralized. And, and even when I look at the federated systems, if I look at something like the new European identity, digital identity, they are suggesting it's self-sovereign. It, you might be able to say it's decentralized, but it's kind of the decentralization of centralized, <laughs> like, um, identity systems for each states it's it's so difficult to unpick this um and there's an awful lot of work to do on it of course but i think we always have to keep in mind um looking to the you know it, it's got to be a, a center without margins i.e it's part of a network that it's it's based on a network it's decentralized we just can't have a centralized authentication like that because it will be used for ill as well as good and absolutely no doubt about that yeah what do you think about policy making around identity or privacy like who whose job is it should it be anybody's job do we need some serious new policies do you think we need to back off and let it be organic like how do you think that should all be playing out in your perfect world that you mean in terms of verification, like the legal identity? All of it, right? Like, is there anybody who should be kind of coming over the top here and saying, you know, we're having mental health issues from young girls on social media, so we need to like fix this kind of thing here, or this privacy issue is a big thing here, so we need to fix that. Like, are there certain policies that you think we need or that should be in the hands of government or uh, the companies themselves? You know, I know it's a big question, but I guess... Yeah, no, it's a very, very important question. I suppose my observation on it is, and, this, and my feeling is, that at the moment, the, the governments and the technology platforms are involved in this discussion and are, in some countries or nation states, moving ahead with this. But the public, to me, seem very either disengaged or left out of this. And this is going back to what I was trying to say, it's very hard to engage people in identity. I need, you probably need to find new language or new examples um, to try and drive this home to people. And it is difficult to go, well, even if you become aware of it, what on earth can you do? It feels like it's big tech versus little me. I can't do anything about it, I'm just one person. Um, I don't think it's necessary. I don't think the solution is necessarily, you know, more citizen assemblies and things like that. We've got a, here, we've got a parliamentary democratic system that ought to be enough. But we can see the online harms bill going through Parliament right now, talking about oh, public harm. 
Um, that is very, very ill-defined. Um, it's called public harm, but we don't really seem to have engaged the public or asked the public what they think is harm. <laughs> um, somebody somewhere has decided what is a public harm, very ill-defined Ill um, for whatever reason, um, and the public seem left out of it. So I don't know what we do about this. But what I do know is that when I spoke to Audrey Tang um, in Taiwan, who's the digital minister, obviously, um, or minister without portfolio that does lots of digital things. <laughs> um, yet she talks a lot about how digital can be used in, parli uh, in participatory democracy. So rather than using these um, digital technologies and tools to kind of control the population or to try and bring about a consensus or to nudge people into behaviors that you know, they don't really naturally uh, feel very aligned to, um, and in some senses threaten them. It was very much her sense that you take the politics out to the people, you go and engage them, um, you go out to whether it's little islands or it's remote villages, you take a telepresence wall so that you can beam the cabinet into a town square meeting and you have those conversations with the people. And it was so inspirational to hear, you know, some of that. And then, of course, they've got their couple of um, at least two platforms where people can upvote and downvote on policy ideas and things like that. I would much rather see something like that. I do think we are engaging with and entering um, an era where we have to have much more dig um, digital and direct democracy, either not necessarily to, um, to substitute for parliamentary democracy, but it, it has to be there to, to complement the population's too big, the issues are massive and complex, and we need to engage public in this. So rather than see the online harms bill, be signed off and, and go to law. I would love to see in the UK, obviously I'm speaking UK specifically on, on this, I'd love to see the public somehow involved using some of those sorts of tools. Of course, nobody's going to do that because the last time we were asked a question, we voted the wrong way, <laughs> according to the powers that be. <laughs> yeah. What, what are some issues that you think aren't getting enough discussion uh, in this area, enough attention? Are there aspects of privacy or identity that you are very surprised aren't a bigger conversation in, in the commons right now? Um, one of the issues will be around genetics and DNA and where that data resides and who does what with it. Early today, actually, um, it was the, there was a piece in the Telegraph about um, swabs. I don't know how true this is, but swabs for um, COVID tests that um, DNA data being sold off to third parties or certainly being shared. And recently in the UK anyway, we had um, GPs, um, GP general practitioner data, the data that you would share with your doctor. We were told that we were going to be asked to sign something to say that, yeah, fine, we, we're opting into that and that's, or was it that we were opting out? I can't remember which way it was, but anyway, it was a big surprise to people that that was even on the table, that that data was going to, be sold or traded or exchanged with um, even academic institutions for research purposes. People were really surprised at that. And I was I was kind of surprised that they were so surprised, um, you know, but then I was surprised that people were so surprised about Cambridge Analytica and some of the things that were happening with data on, uh, you know, well, whatever you think about that particular episode, just we shouldn't really have been that surprised. Um, and I think people are going to be very, very surprised when they find out some of the things that are happening in the space of genetics and what some of the possibilities are right now. Um, and I think that what also is not being discussed very much <clears throat> is, this, is this health space that technology platforms really want to sort of um, to invade now. So I guess you could talk about it in the in the realm as digital phenotyping, but perhaps the best example is Apple saying it wants to detect whether we have depression or not by the way in which we use our phone. Now, I don't want Apple doing that. I'm not depressed. I don't want it telling me I am because my Facebook experience where the machine told me that I wasn't even me leads me to think that, that Apple could well diagnose me in a way that is in no way <laughs> the way I think about my own mental state. 
no doubt somebody somewhere will tell me well, I'm wrong and the machine is right. But that's another issue. Um, I really think that is a huge issue in the Commons and should be being discussed and debated. So anything to do with health data being used uh, in the public space and being used by platforms, which I guess one could say is now the new research facility that we kind of haven't become aware of, but it is. Um, that's not being discussed. Nobody seems to debate, be debating it and um, things are just trundling on. Um, it's, it's a worry. Yeah. How do you feel about the, I guess, the tension there between innovation and something like big data? You know, do you feel like it's good that we have this information going to potentially places like universities who are doing research for us um, and maybe helping us create new medicines or, you know, beneficial products? Or should we be really... So positive. Yeah. I used to feel so positive about it. Um, and um, now I'm more suspicious, I think. And I was trying to think the other day, why is that? And I think it is because, partly because of what's happened around COVID-19, but partly because I've become much more aware of, I think I always thought, well, the market will take care of it. And there's always competition, <laughs> yeah, naively. Uh, and there's always competition. And now I feel like we're in this monopolistic oligar oligarchical world. And there are nation state powers who are increasingly aware that they're losing power so are leaning on you know big monopolistic technology platforms sometimes to deliver what they can't deliver themselves and this whole unholy alliance between the two where they kind of agree that the successful state of the future is a technological state and so I worry that you know there was me doing my little DNA test or whatever a couple of years ago and all right, I did research it and I did talk to a few different companies about their data policies and probably most people don't do that. I don't know, maybe they do. Um, and I'm all for personalised healthcare and I'm all for the sharing of information like that and for it to be put in, I don't know, data trusts or whatever. But at the moment, I don't have the confidence that there is really any governance around any of that. So I think, again, you're quite right. I mean, there that, that's another issue that is is kind of kind of silently just passing by us and nobody's really stopping to address it and it'll probably be too too late by the time we do um but yeah no i mean i was i was looking at that uh i was looking at what's happening in chile where they have brought in that new ruling i don't think it's been signed off yet it's certainly gone through their parliament um but um it was a ruling against the use of neurotech on citizens to either access their minds or memories or change their thoughts and things like that. And I thought that's really proactive and really interesting. And I haven't heard anything like that um, in the UK or the USA, maybe it has happened in the USA, but I think starting to think about some of these possibilities and what, the, what frameworks and what governance we need to put uh, around them before the technology has been harnessed you know would, would be a much better way to go right that makes me think of something like um airbnb or like uber a lot of countries had to deal with the fact that these technological solutions became so popular so quickly that they didn't have time to create policies to keep them under control or it took them quite a long time. And in some cases they just couldn't bring it under control. Do you think maybe that's what we need to do in this space is be more proactive about setting these policies ahead of time so that the technology doesn't kind of force our hands? Yes, I, I, I do. But at the moment, everybody's so fearful and myopic about one issue in health, which seems to be COVID, that nobody can seem to see to a, a world beyond that. Um, and I don't know, I suppose it's our job to try and keep highlighting these things in, in small ways. Um, but we are heading to a world in which we, you know, there's some rather extreme science and technology which will have an effect on ourself and our selfhood, which will end up in quite an extreme self. And uh, I think that's very difficult to walk back from then. Um, we've got a new health security agency that's just been set up. And again, that's kind of pointing to, I mean, it, to all intents and purposes, it's been set up to deal with infectious diseases, what a surprise. Um, but actually, again, it's the more generic public harms. Now, those could be absolutely anything. 
and there's definitely an awakening around <clears throat> the 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 um, boundaries between public harm and surveillance, I think. I think people are kind of waking up to that, but they're waking up to it on a very general, <clears throat> in a very general way, like it's facial recognition on the streets or, you know, it's your phone, you know, as you said earlier, trying to use its profiling to sort of match you or sell you something. But in terms of digital phenotyping and using the data that we create through our own bodies and that is also existing in our own surroundings and environment, putting that all together and then making some kind of diagnosis. I don't think, um, I don't think people are, uh, are that aware. Maybe they are. Yeah, I don't know. Do I don't I don't know if they are. I mean, I think there's a, probably a small segment, but I do, I, you know, I think it's a luxury, honestly, to, to be able to think about a lot of these things and I don't think we're in a space where a lot of people have the time or space or energy or freedom to really contemplate them. And, and that's really unfortunate because they're going to probably drastically reshape everyone's lives very soon. <laughs> mm. I mean, it definitely feels like quite soon technology. I mean, you know, one of the things I guess that I conclude in the book is that we used to have this debate and people were used to this debate around the self and identity of you know, does identity reside in like the physicality the the bodily the body the biology or does it reside in mental realm consciousness etc um but now i think that biology of the self and the psychology of the self has been joined by the technology of the self and I was reminded of that actually when I was you didn't say it, but when I was listening to that Eric Schmidt interview and uh, when when one of the founders of Google said, we want Google to be the third half of your brain. You know, I think we should take them at their word. Yeah. <laughs> I think they probably do. Um, no reason to think they don't. And um, so I was thinking that's exactly it. Once the technology has become more invasive and it's no longer an external, as McLuhan would say, I suppose, an extension to man, once it's internal, there's very little that you can do about it because you're signed up to some terms and conditions then, which is literally become an internal operating system to you and your identity. And I think, you know, without creating any sort of fear, making people aware of that, or certainly having that as a, you know, a, a, a hypothesis would be a good way to sort of get the discussion, the debate going. Yeah. Tracy, I could probably talk to you about this forever, but I know we're coming up on our time here, so I want to respect that. Um, before we go, though, I want to give you a chance. Is there anything that you'd be interested to talk about, let people think about before we go, and then uh, tell people where they can find some of your work or anything you're working on? Of course, yeah. Well, thank you for the opportunity. So it's been, yeah, really, it's really interesting to talk to people who themselves are interested in the idea of identity. So anybody who is, um, please come and talk to me about it. I have um, set up a blog at um, www.tracyfollows.com where I am starting to write a bit more on this, but I'm hoping in the future that I can get contributors to it. And actually we can think about what it means to be you in the future and that we can create some little videos and some you know, user generated content. And we can start to create a bank of, um, you know, whether it's art, or experiential or, or, or technological media, whatever it might be, new ways that we can express and debate this so that we can try and bring it to life for people. Because I'm increasingly thinking that writing it and talking about it isn't enough. You can't just explain about the future of you. We need to evoke it somehow. So at some point, um, and if anybody's interested, then let me know. But at some point, I'd like to do that. I love it. All right. Well, Tracy, thank you so much for uh, taking the time. Thank you.